Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. The bridge to the one true God, Jesus. The beginning and the end, Jesus. The perfect example of perfect love, Jesus. The one who loves us in spite of our failures, takes our worst and gives us his best, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life, the one who broke the chains of our sin, the one who has the power to heal and restore, the one who defeated death and rose victorious on the third day, Jesus. No other name is higher, no other name is greater, no other name than the one we celebrate today, Jesus. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Welcome in. If you're new here, I'm Pastor Nate. Um, and this morning, we're really going to be talking about what is soteriology. And a lot of people don't understand the ologies, but we're going to get into that this morning. So soteriology, uh, it comes from the Greek word for salvation, which is soteria. So you get soteria and ology, and it becomes soteriology. So the noun soteria means deliverance. It means preservation. It means safety. It means salvation. And it's used 46 times in the New Testament. So the, re the word soteriology is the study of salvation. And a lot of people don't understand salvation. There's so many different concepts of what salvation is out here. But this morning, I'm going to give you the biblical understanding and the study, the science of salvation. So anytime you study something, it, it, it's in a category. So soteriology, all of your ologies, theology, Christology, pneumatology, these are a branch of science. The study, the scientific way to study scripture to get the truth out of scripture. Amen. So I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. I'm going to give you a couple of verses here and then we're going to dive right into this. Um, so Hebrews chapter two, verse three, it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Amen. Now flip over to second Peter chapter one, verse 10, second Peter chapter one, verse 10. It says, therefore, brethren. Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. So if we look at the seriousness of this subject, if we look at the seriousness of salvation, if we look at the seriousness of the study of soteriology, which we can see in the two verses above, what will happens is that this is going to be a deep, deep study of your salvation so that you can have an understanding and hopefully by the end of this have an assurance of your salvation that you can walk in the hope the joy the peace the comfort of the lord jesus christ when jesus said whom the son sets free is free indeed this is the salvational assurance that we have in jesus christ amen so salvation from the the vantage point of christian theology can def be defined as simply as deliverance from sin and its consequence. 
So what we're seeing today is a lot of issues with deliverance ministries. We're seeing a lot of people flock to these deliverance ministries because they're saying they're, they're producing these spirits. You're under the spirit of jealousy. You're under the spirit of hatred. You're under the spirit of anger. You're, you're even getting the, the spirits of Leviathan and the spirits of octopus and the spirits of this and the spirits of that. But if you understand salvation... Salvation is the deliverance from sin and its consequence, meaning your freedom has been given. Amen. But there's some prerequisites. There is some prerequisites of understanding how salvation works. So sal soteriology is the study of salvation. And, and there are some prerequisites to understanding salvation that are often classified under different topics in what we call systematic theology. So when we look at systematic theology, we're starting to see the breakdown of who God really is. We know that theology is the understanding of God. Amen. So theology is the understanding of who God is. So in order to properly understand salvation, we really, really have to understand the origin and consequences of sin, the role of God's moral law in revealing our need for salvation. Now, Old Testament laws concerning substitutionary sacrifice and atonement, the work of the Holy Spirit and the regeneration of sinners and understanding of exactly what constitutes the gospel under the New Testament. Now, we've got 14 people in here. Where is the gospel that we are saved by? What is the gospel in which we're saved by? Because these subjects are usually classified under homeritology, Old Testament studies, pneumatology, Christology, and New Testament studies. But there's one gospel in which the Gentiles are saved by. What is that gospel? So in order to understand salvation, you really got to understand what this gospel is. Amen. First Corinthians 15, one through four. So turn there with me. First Corinthians 15, one through four. It says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you received and which you stand by, which also you are saved if you hold fast at that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So we see some prerequisites here, right? Can we agree with that? We see some prerequisites because it says that you have to what? Receive it. You have to receive the gospel. If any of you like football, what's the receiver do? The receiver runs a route and has to receive that ball and has to take two steps in order for it to be a completion. So you have to have full receiving of the gospel. And once you're able to receive the gospel by what? By hearing. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now we're able to stand in that gospel. We're able to stand in what was given to us for our salvation. And because we've received it, because we sit, stand in it, it says now you are saved. Now, there's a huge issue here. There's a huge issue here. Because it says if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So what does it mean to believe in vain? It means the same thing as what Jesus was telling the Pharisees. He said that you profess me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. So what we're starting to see here is that if you, as long as you believe in your heart, really, really believe in your heart, and you stand in that gospel, you're what? You're saved, right? But if you believed in vain, if you just said it with your mouth and not with your heart, now you are what Paul's talking about here is believing in vain. He says, for I delivered to you first of all, but what is this gospel that he's delivering, right? So now we're going to find out what this gospel is that we have to receive, that we have to believe, that we have to stand in, and that we have to continue our operation in. Amen. So he says, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, when he says according to the scriptures, he is referencing the Old Testament. 
He's going back to what he would have knew. Because remember, Paul was a Pharisee. Before he was Paul, he was Saul. So he was Saul of Tardis. And, and we see that he was a, a high-ranking Pharisee member. So he would have knew the scripture. So here he's referencing going back to the Old Testament and seeing the salvation in the Old Testament. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Right? So we see here 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. Now, what is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4? What we see here is that Christ died for our sins. Right? So the first step is we got to believe that Christ died for our sins. Then we look at the second part of verse 3, and we see that according to the scriptures. Now, I just went over that. He's according to what the Torah had revealed, according to what the Old Testament had revealed about the forecoming of Christ, about the salvation of Jesus Christ. Amen. But see, there was proof because Paul gave proof here in verse 4, in the first part of verse 4, where he's talking about the burial, that he was buried for our transgressions, right? So he had to be buried to take that sting of death. Then we have in the second part of verse 4 to verse 8 that he was raised from the dead. Then you see again, according to the scriptures. And then you get the appearance or the proof. So now there's proof of what took place. And we see that proof in verses 5 through 8. It says that he was seen by who? Cephas, then by the 12. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present. But some have fallen asleep. Then it says that he was seen by James. Now we know that James is his half-brother, right? And then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also. So we know that Paul came to the understanding, the recollection of who Christ was on the road to Damascus. Amen. So these are the salv salvific concepts in soteriology with scriptural references. Now, I want you to look at some things this morning because I want you to understand what salvation means. Because there was a substitutionary atonement. You have to believe in the substitutionary atonement in order to understand salvation. So if you would go with me to Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Hebrews 9, verse 28. It says this, it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So we're starting to see here that even the writer of Hebrews, which I personally believe is Paul. And the reason I believe that is because of the literary style in which this book is written. We're seeing that a substitutionary atonement has taken place. Now go with me to first Peter. Go with me to first Peter. Chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 24. And we're going to see this substitutionary atonement once again because it says, Who his own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. So we see that Christ was that perfect substitutionary atonement. Amen. Can we all see that this morning? Are we all together? And because of that substitutionary atonement, because of the substitutionary atonement, what we get is the first step of our salvation. Does anybody in here know the first step of your salvation? What is the first thing that has to take place in your salvation. Anybody? What's that first step? Faith. 
for you guys that's been following me for quite a while, I had a, a ladder that God had given me with 24 words, and this was the first ream of that ladder, justification. Well, before justification comes what? Redemption, right? We have to have redemption. And you're going to see that in Galatians 3.13. What is redemption? Redemption is the purchasing of something for a cost, right? So Galatians 3.13 says Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, right? So we see that redemption has to take place. Right. Redemption has to take place. That purchase has to be made. So you had to be bought with a cost in order for you to be redeemed from death to life. This is a sounding information. And a lot of people don't understand salvation. So I'm really going to break this down with every type of word and every description of what salvation is this morning. You're fine, Dr. James. You're fine. So go with me to. Ephesians 1 and 7. Ephesians 1 and 7. Ephesians 1, verse 7. So because of this redemption, now we're going to roll into what is called the forgiveness that we received to that redemption, right? And you're going to see this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, in whom he have redemption through his blood. So the purchase by his blood... The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So because of the purchase of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of the redemption of Jesus Christ, we now have the, the access to forgiveness. We have that access to forgiveness. Go to Colossians 2 and 13. Colossians 2 and 13. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 13, because it's very important that we understand each of these steps. And if you guys got questions along the way, feel free to ask them and I will answer them along the way. So Colossians chapter two, verse 13 says this. It says, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So we see that we were dead. We were spiritually dead. We were physically alive, but we were spiritually dead. And because of the redemption, we had access to forgiveness. And now that forgiveness has taken us from death to life because he's quickened us together with himself. And the end of verse 13, it says, having forgiven you all of your trespasses. So the word trespasses here is a word for sin. Right. So he's forgiven all your past, all your present and all your future sin. Now, if you don't believe that he's forgiven your future sin, then you have to start questioning. Are you really saved? Because you were not there the day that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried or rose. So if God can't forgive future sin, then your salvation's in question. And we know through scripture that salvation is assured. Amen. So because of the, re, the, the, the substitutionary atonement, because of the redemption, because of the, the forgiveness, now we have what we call the reconciliation. What is the reconciliation? A lot of people don't understand what it means to be reconciled. But if you look at, first, or if you look at Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 21 and 22. It says this. It says, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. So what it's saying is that our mind was wrapped up in the world. Our mind was wrapped up in what the devil was doing. Our mind was wrapped up in the situation with what the, the, the fallen or the depravity of man was doing. So it says, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, and you'll see those wicked works in Galatians chapter 5, right, where it's talking about the works of the flesh, yet now hath he reconciled. Now he has brought you in. Reconciled means to bring in, to join together. 
So then verse 22 says, in the body of his flesh through death. So we see now we're reconciled because of the death, because of the substitutionary atonement, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So because of the death, because of the crucifixion, good morning, Pastor Nick, because of that, now we have been reconciled back to the Father. Remember, the reconciliation is back to the Father through Jesus Christ, right? So we're being reconciled because we have lost communion with the Father in the garden by the sin that took place, the sin of disobedience. So now we're reconciled back to him through the body of his flesh, through death. And now because of that, we're presented to the Father as holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Amen. Now flip with me over to 2 Corinthians. Flip with me to 2 Corinthians. And we're going to look at chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. I'm going to give you guys a second and take a drink. I'm still battling this, but we're getting over it. Amen. So verse 18 says this. It says, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself. Now, remember, I just said that we were reconciled back to the father right? We were reconciled back to the father. A lot of people say, well, we're reconciled to Christ. Well, you're you're kind of right. We are reconciled to Christ, right? Through his body. But who were we reconciled back to? This is very important that you understand this. So verse 18, it says, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself. Who is that himself there? That himself is the father, So it says, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, right? So we're reconciled back to the Father because of the lost communion in the garden. And now we're reconciled back to the Father through Jesus Christ and hath given us the, us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 says, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So we see that the the father was in the son and the father was drawing the world back into reconciliation with him through what Jesus was going to do through the death, the burial and the resurrection through first Corinthians 15, one through four, or you could go all the way to eight because eight through eight is the witness and the proof because now we have proof that this took place by, the witnesses of that right so it was jesus that reconciled us back to the perfection of what christ or of what god the father wanted amen so once we are reconciled once we're reconciled good morning welcome in now we have propitiation what is propitiation i know brother nixon here he's gonna know what is propitiation And I'm going to give you the verse so you guys can go look at it. And so you can understand it. Go to Romans chapter 3, verse 25. What is propitiation? Are you guys, you guys still with me? Am I going too fast? Do I need to slow down a little bit? What is propitiation? Nobody knows. Propitiation is 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 appeasing God, right? It's propitiating or appeasing God, right? The appeasing of God. So when we when we look at what propitiation is, we go to Romans chapter three, verse twenty five. Romans chapter three, verse twenty five. This is what we're going to see. We're going to see whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So who's it talking about here? Who is this really talking about? Whom God has sent forth? Who did God send forth? God sent forth Jesus Christ. Amen. 
So God sent forth Jesus to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So we see that Jesus became that propitiation through faith in his blood. So if you believe upon the death, burial, and resurrection, you, 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 you have now met the appeasement or the, the, the requirement of God because Jesus was the fulfillment of that. He took that sin upon himself so that you were no longer liable for it. He was reconciling you through the propitiation or the taking of the sin and, and allowing you to be reconciled back to the Father. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 17. Hebrews 2, 17, and it says this. It says, Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like Unto his brethren. What's it talking about? Talking about becoming man. Okay. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So now we get to see, welcome in crazy juggalo. We get to see why Jesus was coming as a man. And I did a whole breakdown on Christology so that you could get an understanding of who Jesus Christ is. He had to be that man in order to walk out what man had failed at. Amen. So we see here that he was made to be like unto his brethren. Amen. This was all part of the propitiation of the sin. And once you are the propitiation took place and you were already redeemed, you were already forgiven, you were already reconciled, you, you, you already went through all those steps. What happens is now you are justified. Now, justified is a legal term. Justification is a legal term. And, and understanding what justification means is means that your sin was bought and paid for, right? Something that you deserved was taken and you were found innocent. So you were found innocent because of the justification. And the justification is, is so important because without being justified, you can't be adopted. And I did a whole study on adoption. What does it mean to be adopted, right? So to be justified means that you were found innocent of all crimes. So if you stepped into a courtroom, the judge would say, you know what? He's innocent of these crimes. There's no evidence against him. There's no evidence to hold against him. Why? Because we were justified in that act. Amen. So turn with me to Acts chapter 13, verse 39. Acts chapter 13, verse 39. Welcome in, Rosina. God bless you. Acts chapter 13, verse 39, it says, And by him all that believe are justified from all things. Well, justified from all things means that this is where this, with the song, um, I can't remember, it, the east to the west, right? He loves you as far as the east is from the west. That he cast your sin into the, the sea of forgetfulness, right? Justified means that you are justified from all things. It goes on here in verse 39 because anybody that's trying to keep the law, they have a big issue with this verse here because it says from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. See, the law can't justify you. The law can't save you. The law can't heal you. The law can't set you free. All the law was doing was providing the groundwork to show you that you needed a savior. You needed a savior in order to be saved. And this is why justification is so important. Because you were justified of all things. Amen. Amen. You guys still with me? Now, has anybody ever heard the word imputation? Has anybody ever heard the word imputation? Has anybody ever heard somebody say, well, Jesus didn't impute anything to us and, and we didn't impute anything to him? Amen, Pastor Nick. So what imputation means is that Jesus Christ came down and when he was put upon the cross, he imputed 
Now watch this. Watch this. He imputed his righteousness on us. He gave us something that we didn't deserve, something that we didn't uh, obtain on our own. So he imputes his righteousness on us and then imputes our sin upon him. Now, people's going to be like, well, pastor, you've done lost your mind. Jesus didn't impute anything. Go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's look at verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's look at verse 21. For anybody that's ever told you that Christ didn't impute anything and the, that, that we didn't receive anything and we didn't give nothing to him, I'm fixing to burst their, burst their bubble and bring you the word of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. What we see here in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 is that my sin, your sin, the sin of the world was imputed unto Christ. It says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So if he knew no sin, where did the sin come from? Anybody? Where did the sin come from if he knew no sin? From the world. From us. Amen, Kathy. So we see that our sin was imputed to him. But a lot of people have issues saying that Christ imputed his righteousness to us. Go to Romans chapter 3. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3. <coughs> Romans chapter 3. And let's look at verse 21. Let's look at verse 21. It says, but now the righteousness of of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So we see here by our belief in Jesus, his righteousness is imputed to us. Well, that doesn't say that, Pastor Nate. That can't say that. There's nowhere it says that. Go to Romans chapter 5, verse 19, shall we? Let's see what the Bible says. Romans chapter 5, verse 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by Adam's disobedience, by Adam's sin, we were made sinners. That passed down from generation to generation to generation. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So we see here the imputation of righteousness from God, from Jesus, to us. We see this here in Scripture. You can't argue with it. It's in black and white here. And because of this righteousness being imputed to me, I now have the power to be adopted into the family of God. I can now be adopted into the family of God because I've been justified. I've been found innocent and righteousness has been imputed to me. I can now be adopted into the family of God. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Guys, this is, this is important for you to understand because this is your salvation. Romans 8, look at verse 15. Look at verse 15. It says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, 
But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So now we're starting to see that we have the privilege of calling God our Father. Once again, that communion of separation has now been reconciled, has now been brought back, and now we are in the fold as a child rather than a sinner in a fallen state of mankind. But he goes on, go into Galatians, look at Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 6, Galatians 4, 5 through 6. Remember, we talked about redemption already at the very beginning, we talked about redemption. Watch what Galatians says. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So because of the redemption, because of the redemption, we had forgiveness. And because of the forgiveness, we had reconciliation. And because of the reconciliation, we had propitiation. Then we had justification. Then we had imputation where we became righteous. And now we have the power of adoption to go back into the family of God. You guys with me? And because we've been adopted, because we've been adopted, we now have peace with God. We have peace with God. Look at Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's hope there. Now, I just broke down all of Romans 5 the other day. What we see here, Paul's saying that because we're justified by faith, because we've been redeemed, because we've been imputed, because we've received adoption, now we have peace with God. And because we have peace with God, we now have a peace with others. We can, we can deal with others a lot easier than we could while we were in the world. We'll see that in Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 18, where it says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished... In his flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances for to make himself of twain, one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the Christ, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto Father. So we see the joining of two into one. We see the peace between brothers and sisters. We see the peace that we have now received because we had peace with God. Amen? Are we there? Are we together? So we're starting to see that there was prerequisites in this salvation. There was prerequisites in the salvation. Now, there's a lot of different um, atonement theories and then the, and the historical ad- adherents, right? There, one of the atonement theories was a ransom to Satan, and that was taught by or Orijan, right? So he, he was believing that this was a ransom to Satan for the atonement that took place on the cross. There was a recapitulation, which was taught by Irenaeus. There was satisfaction that was taught by Anselm. There was another atonement theory of moral influence, and that was taught by Abelard. This is why it's so important to get into the church history and get into understanding who all these forefathers were so you can understand the the full teaching or the scientific method of study when you get into soteriology or the study of salvation. Then you had, it was taught by a governmental atonement, and that was by Grotius. You had a dramatic victory by Allen. You had a revelatory atonement, and that was taught by Barth. And you had a substitutionary atonement, which was taught by Calvin. Now, there's only three of these seven that have scriptural support. There's only three of these seven types of atonement that were taught that had scriptural support. Does anybody in here know Latin? 
Does anybody know Latin? Does anybody study Latin? Does anybody understand Latin? Because I'm going to use a word right here, and it's going to be Latin, but I'm going to tell you what it means. So we're going to break down the Historia Salutis. Historia Salutis. What that means is the summary of salvation history. So the Historia Salutis is the summary of salvation history. So there's been chronological studies of the Bible, and it's due to the fact that Christians who have studied the Bible this way have arrived at a better understanding of salvation history. So if we go back to the Old Testament, sin entered the human race through Adam and Eve's disobedience to God in Genesis 3. Can we agree on that? I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. How did sin enter? It entered through the disobedience of Adam and Eve, correct? Okay. When sin came in, it brought with it a curse on creation. Does anybody know what the curse was the, that was brought on the human race by this disobedience? What was the curse that was brought? Anybody? Sin? Well, sin, yeah, it was the acknowledgement of sin. But what we see is the curse, and it comes in Genesis chapter, what? 2, verse 17, right? Anybody know that? Genesis 2, 17. Look, look, go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Separation from God. Amen. Let's look at what it brought. Okay. Genesis 2 verse 17. Because I want you guys in your Bibles. It's very important. I want you in your Bibles. Genesis 2 17 says this. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Thou shalt not eat of it. So we see the command given here. We know that come from Genesis chapter 3. What happens is Eve eats because she was beguiled by the serpent and the tree looked good for food, right? So what was this, the, the curse that came with this? We'll see in 17 here. It says that thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely what? Thou shalt surely die. So we see the first curse that was promised if your disobedience took place, and that's death. That's death, okay? So the first curse on creation was death, and the second curse would be a depraved nature in all of Adam's offspring. What does depraved nature mean? It means a sinful nature, a separation from God, amen? It means that you are now in foreknowledge of the evilness that which has come. So a system of substitutionary sacrifices for sin was developed because God's people were not able to keep God's law perfectly. And we see this throughout scripture that God's people were not able to keep the law. So the promise of a redeemer was given by the Old Testament prophets. The New Testament declares Jesus of Nazareth as the promised Savior and Redeemer of mankind. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, Paul explains the basic elements of the New Testament gospel which are the substitutionary death, the burial, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And it's good morning, Fred. And it's in believing this gospel that sinners are justified by faith, Romans 3.28. And they're restored to a right relationship with holy God, Ephesians 2.8. Believe, faith, and repent. Believe, faith, and repent appear to be synonymous terms in the New Testament. One cannot turn back to God or repent without having faith that the gospel is true and that forgiveness is available. That is what is implied in the New Testament meaning of the word believe. Everybody understands that believe is an ongoing thing, correct? It's just not a one and done. Can we agree that believe or believing is an ongoing process? So if we believe in the gospel, it's ongoing. 
If you believe in Jesus, it's ongoing. Amen. So what we see here is the history of salvation, how it's been around since the beginning. There had to be a salvation, a Messiah that come into play, a, a reconciler that comes into play to reconcile us back to the Father. So we move from Historia Salutis to Ordo Salutis. What is Ordo Salutis? Well, Ordo Salutis is the summary of the order of salvation. There's an order of salvation. Amen. Romans 8, Romans 8, verses 29 through 30. Go ahead and flip there. Romans 8, Romans chapter 8. And we're going to look at verses 29 through 30. Because oftentimes, this is called the golden chain of salvation. Why is it called the golden chain of salvation? It's called that because it describes a process or a sequence of events that takes place in the salvation of every individual. Welcome in, Brother uh, Kapuli. So it describes a process of our sequence of events that takes place in the salvation of every individual. So let's look at this Romans 8, 29 and 30. It says, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them, he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. What is this passage describing? Well, let's break it down. You want to break it down this morning? Let's do it. The passage describes God's foreknowledge. It describes his predestination. It describes his calling. It describes his justification, and it describes the glorification of a lost sinner. So in soteriology, this process is further defined and expanded upon based on the teaching of other biblical passages. We see that God already knew what was going to happen. His foreknowledge, his omnipresence, he already knew the beginning from the end. He knew the middle from the end. He knew the beginning from the middle. He already knew all of it. This is a process which was initiated by God. For all you people out there that think that you did something to get your salvation, you're wrong. You're wrong. And you're unbiblical. Because this was a process that was initiated by God. It was from God's perspective. And there's a definite point in time when those who have trusted in Christ pass from death to life. You'll see that in 1 John 3, 14. But see, this isn't where salvation starts. From God's vantage point, salvation begins with his election of individuals. Whether you want to accept it or not, this is the word of God this morning. You don't have to take my word for it. But I do encourage you to get into the word of God and see what it means when he's talking about this. This is the beginning is was his election of individuals. And this was determined beforehand. And that his saving purpose would be accomplished in them. Well, that, that, there's no way that that's true, Pastor Nate. Now, I'm going to give you a series of verses. And I want you to go look at them on your time and study them. Okay, you ready? John 6, 37 through 39. John 6, 37 through 39. John 6, verse 44. John 8. 47, John 10, 26, John 15, 16. How about all of Romans 9? How about the whole book of Romans 9? How about 1 John 4, verse 19? Let's go there. 1 John 4 and 19. 1 John 
chapter 4, verse 19. Let's see what it says. If you guys are there, put it in the chat. It's a short verse. What does John, 1 John 4, 19 say? <coughs> 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. I'm going to see who's in their Bible. 1 John 4 and 19. What's it say, guys? Who's in their word? Who's got their sword open? Nobody. First John four nineteen says this: We love him because he first loved us. Amen, brother Medi. What does that show you? What does that show you? That shows you his foreknowledge and his election was determined beforehand that his saving purpose would be accomplished in you. God then in due course brings people to himself by calling them to the faith in Christ. Romans 8.30, 1 Corinthians 1.9, 2 Timothy 1.9, 1 Peter 2.9. God's calling produces a regeneration. That regeneration has nothing to do with you. That regeneration has nothing to do with you. Get it out of your mind. Get it out of, uh, around you. Get it out of your thought process. Because the regeneration is the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit in which a spiritually dead person is made alive in Christ. You were once dead, but now you're alive. You were once blind, but now you see. You were once dark, but now you are of light. You didn't do it. The Holy Spirit did it. And because of this regeneration, because of this regeneration, we get a revived heart. A revived heart that repents and trusts. It trusts in Christ and his saving faith as the only source of justification. And justification results in adoption as God's sons. Look at Acts 13 verse 48. Look at Acts 13 verse 48. It says, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. You know why the Gentiles were so excited here? The Gentiles were so excited because they didn't think it was for them. And now that they know that it's for them, they, they understood that they had been appointed beforehand. This is, this is knowledge here. This is knowledge here. Not my knowledge. This is God's knowledge here. He's giving you knowledge and wisdom this morning. Give him praise. So what does it mean to be a Christian? To be a Christian means one rests in the finished work of Christ. There's nothing that you have to offer there's nothing that you can add to. There's nothing that you can bring to. There's nothing left for you to do. You are resting in the finished work of Christ, no longer depending on your accomplishment, no longer depending on your religious pedigree, no longer depending upon your good works for God's approval, but only on what Christ has accomplished on his behalf. It's not about what you can bring to the table. It's about what Christ already gave you. It's about what God the Father allowed Jesus Christ to do for you and then the working of the Holy Spirit inside of you. I hear so many times, well, we can lose our salvation. We can lose our salvation. Man, you can give that back and you can walk away from it. Salvation is not assured. Well, what does Philippians 2, 8 and 9 say? What does Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 say? 
It says, and had been found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also high, hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. He is your salvation. You are now resting in his salvation. You're now resting in the work of Christ. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, says this. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of what? Yourselves. Oh, come on, pastor. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Now you're going to hear people say, well, faith without works is dead. Well, what was James talking about when he was talking about faith without works? Well, when we dig into what James is really talking about here, it shoots us all the way back to what Paul was teaching in Galatians chapter 5. Because if you look at Galatians chapter 5, it says, and this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on. So you're telling me that the works that we do are not of our own doing, but the works are the works of the Holy Spirit through us. That's exactly what I'm telling you. It's not about what you're doing. It's about what the Holy Spirit's doing through you because of the regeneration and the repentance of the heart. So the Holy Spirit is now doing the works through you. The, the, the fruit of the Spirit is the works in which, in which James is talking about. Ooh, we, this is good stuff this morning. So it's not because you go out and you feed the homeless. It's not because you go out and do this or you do that or you do this or you do that. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit through the fruit of the Spirit because now you're producing fruit that other people can take and enjoy the fellowship of one another. Come on, give him praise. The word grace, which a lot of people take for granted, the word grace can be defined as the unmerited favor of God through which we get what we do not deserve. So grace is what we get because God loved us so much. We didn't deserve grace, but God gave it because it, God wanted to show how much he loved us. Faith is the appropriation of God's provision by trust. So your faith was given to you by God. After the calling of God upon your life, upon the regeneration of your soul, your spirit, you were now given faith. And that faith is to be able to believe in the gospel in which you receive, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Amen? But see, there, there, there's a reason that man has an issue is because how should man respond to God's provision of salvation by grace through faith? Because true salvation, and I don't know what you guys have been told this morning, but true salvation is not measured in having raised a hand or prayed a prayer. So many churches around here are saying, you know what, raise your hand and repeat after me. Raise your hand and just say this prayer. Raise your hand and you'll be saved. It's not about a, a raised hand or a prayed prayer or having been baptized or christened. The true test of an authentic work of God in one's life is sanctification as God continues the moral transformation and he begins in regeneration. This transformation is going to continue until the redeemed person is resurrected and made complete and holy in heaven. We have not met the mark, ladies and gentlemen. If you think that you've met the mark, you haven't because you don't meet the mark until you are glorified in the presence of God. You guys with me? Go to Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. And let's look at 28 through 30 again. Let's see this. Because it's a, it's a process, salvation is a process, and the final step of this process is the glorification when we are glorified and in the presence of God in the kingdom of heaven. 
So Romans 8, starting in verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, the righteousness of his son. When it says conformed to the image of his son, he's talking about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's through the imputation process. So because he imputed his righteousness on us, we're now conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now watch. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. There's a process here. There's an order here to your salvation. There's an ordo salutis. There's an order of salvation. Because God's sanctifying work is seen in the growing Christ-like character, increasing love for God and people. And the fruit of the Spirit will be increasing through you because you have yielded yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you. You're no longer operating in the, the works of the flesh. You're now operating in the works of the Spirit because you have yielded to the move of the Holy Spirit. You have yielded to the regeneration. You have yielded to the work of God in your life. See, we can't just be satisfied with our current state of holiness. If, if you're okay with where you're at in your spiritual walk, you're going to end up becoming complacent. You're going to become complacent. You're going to become stagnant. Because we should be confident that through God's sovereign, sanctifying grace, that one day he'll have totally won the victory over sin once and for all, and we are in that glorified state. But we should be striving to be closer to him. We should be striving to be closer in relationship. We should be trying to get holier and holier, but not by our own doing but by the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Amen? Because living with this type of hope, thank you, Hannah, I love you, sis. Living with this hope as one battles sin daily is true Christian perseverance. Did you know that Christian perseverance is itself a sign that one has been born again? Did you know that your perseverance to drive closer to God is a sign that you've been born again? Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, and let's look at verses 13 and 14. Watch this. I want you guys to be persevering to God. I want you to be seeking God. I want you to be in your word. I want you to be in prayer. I want you to be in worship. But most of all, I want you to understand that it's nothing to do with you, but it had everything to do with God. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, look at this. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Now watch, for all you people that believe that you can turn away and walk away and give your salvation back and you can lose your salvation, watch this. It says that after ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So all you people that believe that you can lose salvation are saying you can supersede the power of the Holy Ghost. You better check yourself. You better check yourself. It says, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest. Oh, come on. The earnest of our inheritance. Until what? Until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the praise of his glory. That means you are sealed until God calls you home. You're sealed until God calls you home. How do you unseal yourself from the Holy Spirit? Somebody 
Help me understand this. How do you unseal yourself? If you go back to John, if you go back to John, it says that no one can remove you from my hand, right? And then he, in the next verse, he says, and no one can remove you from my father's hand, which is greater than I. So now you have the foundation of Jesus Christ, which you're standing on, and you have the overshadowing of the Father. You are enclosed in the hand of Jesus and the hand of the Father, and now you have the Holy Spirit tying it together with a nice little bow. See, you're telling me that I can untie that bow, I can unseal myself from the Holy Spirit, I can step out of Jesus' hand, and I can step out of the Father's hand, and and because of that, I can lose my salvation. You've done lost your ever-loving mind. Because if you think you can supersede the power of God, you've lost it. You're out in left field somewhere, and you better draw yourself back in. Because the process of salvation described in Romans 8, 29 through 30, it's defined and expanded in soteriology to include God's foreknowledge, his sovereign election, his predestination, his calling, which is the conviction by the Holy Spirit that the gospel is true. The regeneration, the leading to repentance and faith. The justification, the sanctification. What is the sanctification? It's deliverance from sin. And the perseverance and ultimately the glorification. So you're telling me you can step out of all that. You can step out from being unsealed. You can be unnewly created. You can be unjustified. You can be unredeemed. You can be unsanctified. And ultimately, because of all that, you're going to be unglorified. So you're telling me that God has to renege his word, violate his promise, just so it fits your doctrine. Get out of here. Get out of here. God's word never returns void. Let every man be a liar and God be the truth. It's nothing that you did. It's everything that he did. You see, because you have to understand God's sovereignty. You have to understand the sovereignty of God. If we look at the sovereignty of God, it says no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draweth him and I will raise him up at the last day. The Lord Jesus said that in John 6, 44. John 6, 44, Jesus is saying no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And what's he say? He says, then I will raise him up at the last day. So it's all about what what God Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are doing in you and through you and around you that secures your salvation. This is what we call salvational assurance. And it totally obliviates your so-called free will. It totally gets rid of what you call man's free will. Because if it was man's free will, it says all that the Father gives me will come to me. Uh Uh-oh, go to John 6, 37. I don't want you to hear it from my mouth. I want you to see it with yourself. Go to John chapter 6, verse 37. It says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. It doesn't say may come to me. It doesn't say possibly come to me. It doesn't say might come to me. It says, will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. See, so all you people out there that are saying that you can lose your salvation, you don't understand salvation because Jesus said it's nothing of you doing. You had no partake in your natural birth, so you have no partake in your spiritual birth. And everybody that the Father gives to Jesus Christ, that he puts the calling upon, will come to him. And they will by no means be cast out. Is that is that not clear? Jesus says, I'm not going to cast you out. What does the word cast out mean? Is that casting out would mean that you would lose something. Jesus says, I'm not going to cast you out. 
But when you look at the emphasis on the sovereignty of God and salvation, it's scriptural. And predestination and election are biblical concepts, but so is human responsibility. So is human responsibility. The seeming contradiction of the Bible, biblical teaching about both God's sovereignty and human responsibility is a divine paradox. But to be biblical in theology, both concepts have to be preserved. Look at what Paul says. In Paul's epistles to the Romans, it's, it's a foundational theological treatise. And this is the, the, the treatise is on soteriology. And he addresses the supposed paradox between God's sovereign election Verse human responsibility. And his argument can be outlined in a problem, a solution, and a formula. Okay? What is mankind's problem? Come on, guys. What's mankind's problem? Let me give you a verse. Romans 1.18. Sin. There you go. So man's, mankind's problem is the need of salvation because of sin. Right? We needed a Savior because of sin. So the Gentiles are, are, are under condemnation of conscience. The Jews are under the condemnation of the law. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what was God's solution? Romans 5 and 1. What was God's solution to all of this? Romans 5 1. Come on, guys. Romans 5 1. Romans 5 1. Romans 5 1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have justification by faith through Jesus Christ. You see, mankind's problem is this, that we have moral depravity, inability, and sinful tendencies. We're lost, we're dead, we're broken. We're physically alive, but spiritually dead. So God's solution to that was regeneration which you see in Romans 8, 1 through 4. Then we have another mankind problem, which is sovereign election and predestination, the supposed sovereign election of God of a certain portion of the human race to salvation and the divine reprobation of all others. But what was God's solution? You see, there's not a problem that God hasn't brought a solution to, and God's solution was the universal opportunity which we see in Romans 10, 13, which we see in John 3, 16, which we see in 1 Timothy 2, 6. God sent his only son that whomsoever, that wasn't limited. That was a universal opportunity that was open to whoever would believe upon Jesus Christ. So if we look at what Paul is talking about here, Paul's argument, although God is sovereign and has the ability and authority to elect only some or even none of the human race to salvation, in his mercy, under the present administration of grace, he has chosen to make the opportunity available to all. He has extended this to everybody. Do you guys understand this? Go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. It says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote of four and few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the Son of Men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostle and prophets of the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by what? By the gospel. He opened this to everybody. Remember, when Jesus first came, he said, I came to the lost sheep of the house of who? Israel. But because of Israel's rejection, Paul was now given the gospel to go and take to the Gentile. Th 
there's many theological con- traditions that that deny that we can be assured of eternal life. Roman Catholicism, for example, is one of them. They deny absolute assurance. They believe in purgatory where you got to pray for your loved one and enough prayers will and lit candles will get them to heaven. But let me tell you something. If they didn't believe Jesus and they didn't believe the gospel, all you're doing is adding more fire to the fire that they're going to by lighting that candle. But you see, the Bible teaches us that all believers can have assurance of salvation because we have the testimony of three infallible witnesses. We have the testimony of Jesus where he says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment has passed from death into life. John 5, 24. If you look at John chapter six, verse 37, it says all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So we see by the testimony of Jesus that we have assurance, but that's not where it stops. We have the testimony of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in Romans 8, 16 says this. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are what? Children of God. And the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know of him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14, 17. So now we have two witnesses. We have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We have the testimony of the Holy Spirit, but we have the testimony of Scripture. Go to 1 John 5, 13, because 1 John 5, 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know you have eternal life. It doesn't say that you may lose eternal life. It doesn't say that you had eternal life. It doesn't say that you might get eternal life. It says that if you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. That's hope, and that's a promise. John 20, verse 31 says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You see, people that don't understand the assurance of salvation... Let me, let me break it down for you this morning in common terms. The assurance of salvation is based objectively on the promises of God and inner witness of the Holy Spirit. You'll see that in John 5, 24, 1 John 5, 1, and 1 John 5, 13. And then it's subjectively on our maturity and growth in Christ. You're going to see that in 1 John 2, 3. 1 John 2, 9 through 11, 1 John 2, 29. You're going to see it in 1 John 3, 14, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You see, the doctrine of eternal security of the believer means that once the gift of salvation is genuinely received, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the moment that you heard and received and stand in, It cannot be lost. This idea is based on the following scriptures. Let's look at these scriptures. John 10, 28 through 30. Come on, guys. You should be highlighting these verses in your Bible so that you can stand on the assurance and the hope that Jesus gives you. John 10, 28 through 30 says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. John 10, 28 through 30. Flip over to Romans chapter 8, 31 through 39. Anybody that believes you can lose your salvation, you have a lot to explain here. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall be a charge against God's elect? If it is God who justifies, who is he who condemns? If it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now watch this. For all you guys that believe that you can lose salvation, let me ask you a question. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or a sword? 
as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Explain to me how you can lose it. You can't do it. You can take scripture and twist it and try to make it fit your narrative and your agenda. But if you just let scripture talk, it shows your assurance. We have to start understanding the assurance that we have. We have to rightly divide the word of God. So that we can understand the, the assurance of our salvation. This is what soteriology is, is the study of salvation. Now, I could go on for the next two hours and continue talking about salvation. But I think we've dove in deep enough to where you can understand what's taking place here in Scripture. See, there was an atonement, right? The atonement, which, ma which, which made reparation for a wrong or a wrong or an injury to cover or make reparation or uh, expiration for sin. So you had the atonement of sin. Then to believe, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, means to accept as true. And you're, you feel sure of that truth. If you think you can lose your salvation, you're not standing in the gospel. Then we have the calling of the Holy Spirit through the Father. And that, that means to summon verbally. Right? To call you. Then you have a conviction, which is a formal declaration, a verdict, or a decision. You have an election, which is a formal or organized process of electing or being chosen. But in Christian theology, it's being chosen by God for salvation. You have foreknowledge. What is foreknowledge? Foreknowledge is the awareness of something before it happens or exists to know beforehand. In Christian theology, it means it's God's ability to know the end from the beginning. You'll see that in Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Predestination. In Christian theology, the divine foreordening of all that will happen, especially with regard to salvation, associated with the teachings. sanctification right to make holy set apart as sacred consecrate to purify or free from sin or error are we understanding this this morning are we on the same page do you guys understand salvation is there any questions on salvation is there any questions guys <laughs> 